Imagine that you're sitting in a theater in the late 2010s. You're about to watch a nice, fun, exciting movie, and a trailer shows up. This giant gorilla, named to be King Kong, is fighting Godzilla. You know, Godzilla, the giant city-destroying monster with laser breath? What is going on here? Who came up with this? How is Kong even remotely close to the power level of Godzilla? That was me. And to this day, I've just sort of accepted the MonsterVerse as a weird Hollywood creation because people like big monsters fighting. Seems like a reasonable idea. Turns out that 50 years before this, these questions were already asked and answered. So how does something like this happen? In the 1960s, one of the original creators of King Kong, William O'Brien, passed a script around for a King Kong vs. Frankenstein idea that he had. A producer took the script and tried to get a buyer. It's not like monster mashup movies had never worked before. However, no American studios wanted the script, as it had been like 30 years since the last King Kong film, but it was picked up by Toho in Japan. Toho was partially inspired by King Kong when they created the original Godzilla movie, so this seemed like the perfect opportunity. Also, Frankenstein is old news and a separate license, so just replace him with Godzilla. It's perfect. Elephant in the room, though, is Kong. How is he going to stand up to Godzilla? The answer that Toho came up with was pretty simple. Make him literally stand up to Godzilla. He went from 50 feet tall in the original movie to 150 feet tall in this adaptation. This is obviously so that he could fight Godzilla in the movie and be portrayed in a rubber suit, you know, just like his counterpart. This would make filming the action scenes much easier than relying on stop motion or trying to blend the two techniques together. In the film, he also has superpowers as electricity seems to follow him and supercharges his energy and strength. This gave him the in-universe tools to stand up to Godzilla. Anyways, as the title suggests, these guys fight. But how do they end up there? The answer is Big Pharma. It's not even a joke. On Feral Island, there are berries that can be turned into a narcotic called Soma or Feralactin. On Feral Island, there is also this mysterious god creature rumored to be larger than mountains. I wonder who that could be. Big Pharma wants the berries for drugs and the monster for advertising, so two guys are sent to bring the god back to Japan. Meanwhile, a nuclear submarine sees a weird glowing iceberg, so they crash into it. This is clearly a bad idea because Godzilla is inside. This is my first Godzilla film, so I expected them to either like show his origin or implied he has attacked before, but that isn't what happens. Instead, they just recognize Godzilla, but still have no idea how to defeat him. He's just here now, and he wants to destroy Japan. According to some random paleontologist, Godzilla is just a really old dinosaur and wants to return to his roots. This seems preposterous. This puts both on a collision course for Japan. I mean, eventually. All this setup is cool and all, but I want to talk about the real kaiju battle in this movie. Random guy versus lizard. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm talking about King Kong versus giant octopus. The greatest thing I've ever seen. They had a real octopus just slither around a miniature set, and it looks so good. Like, the contrast between its pulsing gooiness and King Kong's rough exterior make a great contrast, and it feels genuinely menacing. Also, the stop-motion tentacles are hilarious. This movie surprisingly features some stop-motion aspects, probably as an homage to the original King Kong movie. Here's my favorite. Meanwhile, back on Faroe Island, King Kong shows up to save the tribal folk from the octopus, and as a reward, he gets wasted off of Soma. This gives our pharma explorers the opportunity to attach Kong to a raft that gets towed off the island. He needs to get to Japan somehow. The best part about this plot thread is that the boat doesn't even take King Kong into Japan. Customs tells Big Pharma to take King Kong back, you know, because of the security risk. They say, nuh uh, blow up the raft, and King Kong just decides to swim away, but not back to his home. Instead, so he goes straight to Japan. Why? The paleontologist guy says that he instinctively wants to fight Godzilla, but like, how would he know that Godzilla exists? This now sets up an invasion by both Godzilla and Kong into Japan. Let's see how the humans try to defend. Step 1. The humans send out a bunch of tanks against Godzilla. Predictably, Godzilla just lights their military base on fire, and less tanks now retreat from Godzilla. Pretty big loss to start. 
Luckily, the Japanese government is prepared, kinda, and has started to evacuate citizens. They're trying to go for the old hunting trap technique. They light two canals on fire and funnel Godzilla into a fake floor pit. Godzilla steps on the floor, falls into the pit, and all of the dynamite in Japan will explode. Honestly, it's a solid plan, but Godzilla has plot armor, and he isn't even phased. Luckily, on the journey, Godzilla took a detour to attack public transit. The government notices that he doesn't like stepping on electrical wires. Imagine having public transit everywhere. Seems pretty awesome. So the solution is to surround Tokyo in a giant electrical fence to keep Godzilla out. This works, but unfortunately for them, King Kong's also in Japan. It's time to talk about King Kong. Listen, I, I like the big monkey in this movie. He's a funny guy. He doesn't really look like a gorilla. His fur is too red, almost like an orangutan, and his face feels a little lizardish. Maybe that's a fault of the suit, but it keeps him from feeling truly, well, you know, dangerous. Secondly, compared to Godzilla, this isn't really much of a fair fight. Actually, that's, that's not entirely fair. The writers already scaled up King Kong to match Godzilla, and they could have given him power to match. But they don't. Instead, he could throw rocks at Godzilla, but these don't really have much effect. And the atomic breath, like, lights his fur on fire, so he's not even flame resistant. All he has is electricity. When he appears on Faroe Island, there is a bunch of clouds and thunderstorms that really give an ominous feeling. But it turns out these clouds actually power King Kong. Kong has a chance. Electricity makes him stronger. Now watch. Electricity makes him stronger? Uh-huh. This leads King Kong to meet the electric fence. He just eats the fence because he's immune to electricity and waltzes into Tokyo. I was expecting Godzilla to follow him and they'd have an epic battle while destroying Tokyo. That isn't what happens. Instead, Kong takes his own shot at public transit to recreate his original film. He grabs a woman out of the train, throws the train into a building, and then jumps on a building. I feel like this is just so the super fans making this movie can make their own King Kong scene. And you know, I, I can't really blame them. But where does this come from? Kong is shown to be hospitable to the natives on Faroe Island, but once he reaches Tokyo, he decides to attack humans and destroy property. Is this just because he's in a kaiju movie? Yeah, probably. <laughs> to neutralize Kong's rampage, the humans bomb Kong with Soma, so he falls asleep and they can airdrop him onto Mount Fuji to fight Godzilla, as the humans root for both to die somehow. <laughs> this is the actual plot of the movie. So finally, we are here to the real fight. These guys meet up once before earlier in the movie, but Godzilla burnt Kong's chest hair, so he just scratched his head and walked away. So real for that. Words cannot do justice to this final fight, so really quick, my top 10 moments of the fight.
King Kong ends up winning with Godzilla disappearing into the water, his fate remaining ambiguous. So, is this movie any good? That depends on the definition. One way that this movie really suffers is characterization. For as much as I've ragged on Kong in this movie, what it does right is establish Kong as a monster. There's a lot of mystery surrounding Kong, and as the explorers venture deeper into Faroe Island, Kong's arrival is delayed. Instead, we see hints of an existence before he finally appears to fight the giant octopus. It's a great payoff for the build-up around who Kong is and what he represents to the island. This is probably why the electricity part was added. The constant thunderstorms on the island really adds to the mystique and power of King Kong. On the other hand, Godzilla gets no characterization. They appear in an iceberg, they break out, and everyone just accepts that Godzilla is here. It's like he's an avatar or something. Godzilla just feels like a normal part of the world compared to Kong, and that hurts the feeling of danger. What also hurts Godzilla being a threat is that most of his destruction is shown off screen. Kong gets most of the screen time, while Godzilla just gallivants his way through Japan via map sequences. Godzilla only seems to be a threat to the countryside, not to the actual cities. This movie also suffers with the human characters. For one, watching this movie in English is rough. The ADR is extremely stilted and often feels completely out of place, which makes getting absorbed in the human characters' motivations and characteristics completely difficult. Look at this sewing machine thread. This is wire, stronger than steel. Secondly, the characters are extremely wooden. There's the scared adventurer, the not scared adventurer, the kooky boss, and the sister that's constantly in danger. These characters get no depth since they just have two short establishing scenes before the action starts. As such, they're just props to make the action happen. I have no fear of the sister being hurt when she's picked up by Kong, because she's just a prop to do the King Kong thing, not an actual person. This may seem like a lot of hating on the movie, but I do really like it. The action's fun and the plot's goofy enough that I could, I could ignore a lot of the problems. But the best part of this movie has nothing to do with it, but instead with its reception. It was the second highest opening in Japan at the time and became a massive financial success. That led Toho to dust off Godzilla and turned him into the franchise that has lasted to make a second version of this 50 years later. This led to Mecha Godzilla. We really sh 